Back for another episode of The Coach. The Coach being Ross Lyon. G'day, Ross. Damo, always a pleasure, but had enough of the coach. Ex-coach, media personality now. Media personality. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I, like I read it. that somewhere. I almost fell off the chair. <laughs> but have you got a personality, Ross, to, to have in the media? Is that... No, I wouldn't have thought so. You guys set such a high standard. <laughs> Are you enjoying it now you've uh, raised it? Yeah, 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 I am enjoying the experience. It's been interesting um, to see how everyone goes about it. So, But look, it's been 12 shows on Footy Classified, but uh, with no football game. So it should get a bit easier with football to talk about. Well, it's clearly getting close because we've got players from the same team punching on. Kyle Hardigan and, and Billy Frampton of the Crows having a, a skirmish. Um, I've got no issue with it at all, Ross, for what that's worth. As a coach of a, of, of a, of a couple of clubs and as a player for, uh, for a couple of clubs as well, um, is it that uncommon and, and do you like it? Uh, it doesn't worry me, uh, competitive juices. I thought it was going to be a fierce showdown if uh, that's the standard, but um, I was trying to see who come out on top. But as a player and coach, I've um, experienced um, seeing them, a few, a few notable ones. So um, it's never pleasant, but uh, competitive juices, it happens. Yeah. So, so if you're Matty Nix and you see Hardigan and, and Frampton go at it, and, and given what the whole industry has been through for the past 12 months. Um, I know you can't literally put yourself in his shoes, but is it a good thing? Uh, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It's been a tough period for everyone. A lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety. And sometimes it manifests and um, they're competing. They just look like a bump after a goal or something. So, And someone trying to assert themselves and, you know, it's, at the end of the day, your teammates, but you need to pick yourself. I always say you pick yourself. The best 22 tends to pick itself. So I think it was a regular occurrence. It's the same place. It's not healthy, but it's a, the occasional sort of little outburst where, look, it, everyone would have a story where there's been a blur. I, I was a 17-year-old kid at Fitzroy. Robert Walls was coaching a shepherding drill and two tough characters, um, Graham Osborne, Richard Osborne's brother, and uh, Les Parrish, who was a senior player who's passed away. But he um, was a shepherding drill, and Les was shepherding, and his arms got a little bit high. And Gra- Graham Osborne was trying to get through and impress the coach. And in the end, Graham Osborne let go a big right hook right onto his jaw. It would have felt me. And 40 players watching it was frightening. I thought it was going to erupt, and no one knew what to do. And Les turned around and just handled it really well. And Wallsy just, get out to your positions. I thought, geez, this is bad income. <laughs> get your elbows down. And then another one, if you try, uh, Mickey Conlon, who was quite a fiery character. Parkin used to put him in the pre-season teams. We were playing corridor football up at Parade. Ruzi and I laughed about it all the time. And Mick was pretty fiery. His team had lost and he was walking off. And Murray Brown. I think Jeff Brown's brother, yep. um, ex Collingwood player, when the Fitzroy was mouthing off at Mick, and, and he got too close to Mick, and Mick just dropped him from memory. It was a little <laughs> bit frightening. <laughs> so look, it happens, everyone. And I remember at the Dockers, I, I'm pretty sure it was Jack Anthony was mouthing off. It was either Super or Valentine? They're both pretty fiery, and, and then it erupted as we were walking back into the huddle. So they had to go and be separated as well. So. Um, now you get it on tape because you've got all the cameras have a laugh about it uh, the next day of training. Yeah, so, so I suppose what you're saying there, Ross, if, if it's relatively isolated and, and it's for organic reasons, not, not simmering, festering issues, it's, it's actually a good thing at a footy club, potentially. Well, it doesn't hurt. You, know? yeah. Look, you like to think no one gets hurt. No one. I mean, the game's cleaned up. But, you know, boys would be boys and, you know, like, they, they scuffle and they wrestle. I mean, not a lot of people are going to like it, but, you know, from, from young ages. and So, as long, long as it's not, you're right, as long as it's organic and it just pops out of nowhere and it goes back, you know. But, yeah. look, it should be a fiery showdown. If you can compete that fiercely against your teammates, um, mm. you know, but someone clearly crossed the line or someone was wound up like a top for it to happen. Your Guy Footy is a fresh take on the game we love for everyone through an Indigenous lens. Join me, Bianca Hunt, and Tony Armstrong at 8pm every Wednesday night on NITV and afl.com.au. 
Ross, the illicit drugs policy, you've obviously been around the competition. When it was first introduced, you would have still been in a, an assistant coach at the Swans. So you saw it through that lens initially. You're then at St Kilda, then Dockers, and now as a, as a media personality. Um, what have you made of it? I, I, I ask because of Jonathan Hayes' comments recently about going through a fair part of his career on, on two strikes and also, I suppose, by extension, ha- having access, in his words, to the, the Hawks' medical cabinet at times he needed it. Well, that surprised me. I think the accountability, uh, my experience just recently, uh, the, the doctors control the medical cabinet. And, I mean, drugs have always been drugs, prescription drugs. They always should have been locked away. I don't care what era. So someone should be putting their hand up there. Um, but I, I personally have liked the policy that the AFLPA, it's a voluntary policy, the illicit drugs. So let's understand that. If the AFLPA chose to, they, they could withdraw from it and it wouldn't exist. So there's not too many workplaces that submit to what AFL players do. Um, and it's clearly about helping people and identifying people that need help and their well-being. So I've liked that. Unfortunately, there's been some loopholes and it has been exploited on occasion. So well, I'd like to see it tightened up, um, but it's not as simple as people say, you know. So, mm. um, But, yeah, there's some horror stories out there. Ross, if, um, if you're using the word policy on it, and look, I've yeah. had a, a long view on this, and, and I think some people may be even tired of my personal view on it, and that is that it was never set up to expose a player publicly. And I get that. I, I now get why that was the case, the well-being, um, the, the, health, the health of the club. Yeah, so in that regard, though, would it be better off calling it a, a, a drugs code of conduct as opposed to a drugs policy because a, a drugs policy as we had traditionally known it to be through Asada and, and WADA was, was to expose an athlete. Are we better off maybe changing the, the language around it? Well, to be clear, WADA and Asada still exist. So if you take illicit drugs and they're tested on game day, you, it, it's a penalty. It's a four-year penalty. Hmm. So it's, an, it's illicit drugs. It's yeah. Um, but when you've now got Brock McLean end, and, and Jonathan Hay, Ross, so in, the, in the last month publicly, uh, Brock McLean and Jonathan Hay have gone public with their issues with it. Um, we know what happened to Ben Cousins, which was ultimately the reason the AFL brought it in um, around that time anyway. If, if they're not catching them under that situation, um, there's an issue. Well, even it? that term, catching them, I, I don't like the term catching them. It's, yeah. we're, we're here to support and help. So young people need help. Um, and it's the way, so the testing has been to identify them and put support and education and in some rehabilitation, I would think. So that's the aim. And as I said, it's voluntary. The FLPA can go and the players can go, well, we're not undertaking this anymore. So I don't think, you know, and I think, you know, there's different industries that the, you know, the mining industries and, you know, where there's industrial equipment. You get tested, and if it's present in your system while you're on at work, well, you're done immediately. If you have one drop of alcohol or BHP, you're gone. So, but in the context of AFL football, I mean, they're doing it. It's coming from their their, their social time. So, it's a real conundrum. Uh, there's enough support to help them, and I would like a system that would identify and help. But you're always going to have people exploiting the system. But make no mistake, if they're identified game day, it's four years. So um, it's a very complicated issue. I'm mm. not here to catch people and hang people out to dry. I don't like that. And if you think about, you know, if, you, if you've got a son, Damon. Yeah, I've got a couple. A couple of sons yeah, here entering, entering the age where it's going to be an issue for, for well, them and their, their friends. Son. Yeah, it's your mm. son. And they're going to go through life experiences and grow. If they're growing in the public eye and, and they make a mistake, do you want them to be exposed on, on a national paper and TV when it's, and they might need legitimate help. No, I, no, I, I, I don't. I'm but sure the, we do. No, but there's also part of me too, Ross. If you, if you sign up to, to something, um, that's the outcome of doing it. Um, I, I hear what you're saying. And look, certainly yeah, over the 50... voluntary. I, yeah. I think the AFLPA, they need to be all in or all out. I yeah. think, I think what, yeah. they've jumped into the AFL and the AFL want to be um, a driver of standards in the community and that's great. But you're right, it's either let's sign up to almost a zero tolerance to it or whatever it is. or Because, look, I was a senior coach and I didn't understand how there was no three strikes because we, we all hear the rumours and 
and we know people. But I think there's some once people get identified that they need help, they, they can never get to three strikes. I think no, they can't. You, you'll never get you'll never get three strikes yeah. and unless there's a complete abuse of the system. You'll never so get, a, get a player exposed as three strikes so under that system. Of, let's get rid of the three strikes. I think yeah. come up. There's enough smart people and enough well-meaning people and enough resources to get together on this and get a really positive outcome that that helps AFL players and can be a community leader, I would have thought. Yeah. Ross, we touched uh, maybe four or five weeks ago on uh, the Matt DeBoer situation, uh, leaving the Dockers to go to the, 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 the Giants and to have an impact at both clubs as, as a person as much as a, as a footballer. Hayden Ballantyne spoke to Dylan Buckley on his podcast, Dill and Friends, uh, quite recently. And the issues come up again. Um, the removal or, or the moving on of DeBoer, uh, Mzungu was another one, Michael Barlow and, and even uh, Alex Silvani was, was referred yes. to by Hayden Ballantyne as a, as a ripping out of the heart and soul type of player at, at the, the Dockers. I know you've addressed this. I know you've been open about this. No, I'm happy to talk about it. That's yeah. How do you look back on those exits? And look, um, that group, you know, they, they built. Mark Harvey played a role. I played a role. Um, challenge 12, 13, 14, 15. 13 grand final. 15, top of the ladder in a prelim. Um, so, and then we went really badly in 16. So, it's, I mean, it's not as simple as the heart and soul, but they were, everyone talks about leadership groups, but they, you know, DeBoer sat in the leadership group, great people, but um, Barlow and Silvani and Mzungu, you know, and leading teams would call them the backbone group. You, you need a way to numbers that drive the, the, the culture of the, the team and the club at that point. So, Mzungu, great person, really was influential in getting him back to the Dockers when he finished to get involved in the NGA. He was going to go into teaching, and I said, mate, this would be great for you. And he's still there, and he's a pretty special kid, the way he plays himself. Um, but what happens is you've got list managers in a club that go, well, we haven't got there. McFarlane's retired. Um, we need to rebuild, right? And so as a coach, you go, okay. Um, so Mick Barlow would be racking up 40 in the twos, but, you know, and you're getting, you, you, you play your kids. So, um, you know, like Cher and Brayshaw played 42 out of 44. So what happens is, and we have the conversation, look, we're going to have to play these first round and second round and third, or any kids that are here. Silvani was a little bit unlucky in that we recruited Hamling through the door um, and you had Alex Pierce coming. And then you draft Griffin Lowe. So Alex doesn't play and Alex needed an opportunity. Um, but ultimately, Alex was never able to fully consolidate. He was a fierce competitor, but had some weakness. Mick Barlow, he had, a, he had the horrific leg injury and then he had this heart, he broke his scap, fractured his scapula, which is you know, at the back of the shoulder. Horrendous injury. And, and Mick, and Mick's greatest strength was his belief in his work rate. And he would still think he could play at foul footy now. Now, would Mick play and rack him up? Yeah, but would he be able to do everything you need and be as effective? No. He could go and play at foul footy tomorrow, Mick, um, and, and rack him up. But it's probably not getting you to where you need to go. Um, the poor, really, we lost the tag. I stopped using a tagger after Crowley. Um, but really, I probably should have kept one. <laughs> and, and he was the man for the job. So, you know, sometimes you've got to identify what they can do. Um, but you're right. So, but in time, what you want is Brayshaw and Chera um, and Alex Pierce is already in the leadership group. Logue, all those guys need to come in and, and come through like those guys have done and, and build a great team and again, a great culture within the football club, I suppose, because it starts with your footy team. Um, and and now the reasons why. Yep. No one was more connected. Nick Subin was another one. He got really frustrated, but we had to find out, you know, and keep playing um, the kids that we had. So Daniel Pierce was another one. He was a 200-game player, racking them up. Dawson I played in the twos for a year to play low, and he embraced that role. And to the credit, all of them, when they went to Peel Thunder, really brought the kids through, as frustrated as they were. And sometimes it was tough to me because I knew they could help us win games. So um, it's certainly not tanking. But 
you're playing kids to come through and it's going to cost you games of footy along the way. So he's right. They were, they were heart and soul and, and great parts of the fabric of that group. And it gets ripped apart. You know, Subin, Pierce, well, they're six players. So could we have won more games in 16 and 17 if they kept playing? Yeah, but um, Logue doesn't get his games and Sean Darcy doesn't get his games, all those sort of kids. So um, he's spot on. And he was one too, Valentine. Um, ended up in the twos as well. But that's just the way it goes. Mm. Ross, as always, thanks for your time uh, on the coach. Thanks, Damo. Great to be here.